All right. Today is Tuesday, January 25th, and this is a recap for the stock market activities today. Folks, I got a good one for you tonight, but where do we start? What happened in the market today? It looked so good yesterday, not so hot so today. A nice warm pie right in the face, but it's not that simple, folks. Let's start by this. In focus tonight. How about a sentiment check? Let's see where the market sentiment is right now. But before we do that, what about this candle that we got in the morning? Everybody woke up in the morning. The market crashed. What happened? Hold your horses. It was an error. Perhaps a fat finger. This is a daily chart, by the way. As you can see, this is what we saw in the morning. And this is the weekly look. And again, it looked scary in the morning and the conspiracy theories came out. Perhaps this is a precursor for something big that's about to come. Perhaps it is a telltale of an upcoming market crash, yada, yada, yada. We have seen this phenomenon before and the simplest explanation is perhaps it is a fat finger trade. Somebody messed up the bid to ask ratio and the charts picked up on that. But yes, it is a telltale that somebody big, a whale, was planning to sell. And the action today confirmed that. We pretty much erased a huge chunk of the rally yesterday. So where do we go from here? Let's back up and talk about what I said before the year even started. If you watched my Warren Buffett, the upcoming bear market video, I explained in details using the Buffett indicator why this market is going to crash in 2022 and why we're going to shift from a bull to bear market. We are at the beginning stages of this shift from a bull to bear market. It is an adjustment. It is an unwinding of the mania that took place for almost two years now under the umbrella of the easy money policy by the the Federal Reserve that allowed such mania to be invoked in the stock market, pushing valuations out of whack, or we're now unwinding all of that mania, aka the reversion to the mean. And we've seen this happen before in multiple bull markets. Most notably, after the dot-com crash, we had a multi-year bear market. One of the most important characteristics of a bear market is bear market rallies, which are notorious. They can produce double-digit gains in a short amount of time. And in my opinion, we just started the process of one of these bear market rallies yesterday. You see, the position of this channel has been nothing goes up or down indefinitely. If you go up, too high, too fast, you're going to become overbought, quote unquote, and the market is going to pull down in a correction. Likewise, when the market goes down impulsively, like we're seeing right now, it's not going to go down in a straight line forever. It's going to become oversold. We look at certain indicators and we make an educated adjustment and a decision whether to hold these shorts, to close them, book profits, and perhaps switch to the other side playing an upcoming rebound because these indicators, for the most part, are spot on. The timing, that's a different story, but you can use these indicators to assess the risk versus reward. And right now, using these indicators, the risk versus reward says, if you've been short, you gotta book your profits and perhaps consider playing an upcoming rebound rally. Yet the market is not going to make it easy for any of us, the bull camp or the bear camp, because there is a process known as washing away the weak hands. Take, for example, what happened today. Yesterday, massive rebound, one for the books. The bulls felt a little confidence here to buy the dip and join the rally, which turned out to be a bull trap, at least for now. What do you know? The market opens up down today, and these bulls get shaken out quickly. They get scared. Oh, the market is not done. It's not bottoming. Let's get out of here. What happens from the bear camp? The Johnny-come-lately bears, who did not short before like we did back in December, now that they missed out, they say, ah, oh, you see, that was a bull trap. The market is going down. Let's short. Let's buy some puts. So what do you know? The market reverses again, and it almost went all the way to the green. It did not close in the green. It went down again. This is a process of the frustration to cleanse out the weak hands, be it longs or shorts. Now, here are some of the sentiment indicators that we use to assess the risk versus reward in being long or short the market from a trading perspective, not an investing perspective. The investing perspective has to have a longer term horizon. The trading perspective happens day by day, week by week. So far, the drop in the NASDAQ, the drawdowns are over 10% in a short amount of time. The biggest, a most severe correction we've had in almost two years now, and it happened rapidly. Now, when we look at the sentiment indicators among market timers, for the entirety of the market, we are seeing a negative reading, and it is the lowest reading since the aftermath of the crash in 2020. What does that mean? We're seeing 
fear. We're seeing market timers saying it is not a good time to buy the market right now, which serves as a contrarian indicator. We have plenty of fear, plenty of hesitancy when people say, oh, we have another 10% to the downside before the market bottoms. In all likelihood, the market will bottom and rebound before that. Now, is this reading too extreme to suggest that this is a contrarian indicator? The answer is maybe. Yet we're not seeing extreme negative readings. Minus 10, minus 20, minus 30, like we've seen back in the crashes of 2018 and 2020, the COVID crash. When you see readings at minus 20, minus 30, you gotta buy the dip. We're not there yet. Yet when we look at the sentiment indicator, the same sentiment among market timers for the NASDAQ, this is an extreme reading, extreme negative reading indicating extreme fear in the NASDAQ. Matter of fact, it is so negative, the reading that we have right now, it reads below the negative reading we got during the March 2020 bottom. What does that mean? The risk versus reward says you gotta close your shorts and start opening long positions to play the upcoming rebound. Again, there are no guarantees here. Nobody knows what the market's gonna do tomorrow, a week from now, a year from now. But we use these indicators to make the best educated decisions. And again, this kind of bounce, it's gonna be under the bear market bounce category which means it's going to be big, it's going to be powerful, it's going to produce a lot of gains, but all in all, it's going to end up being a bull trap and we will see more losses to come. This is at least my call. And it is shared, by the way, by many strategists on the street. For example, the headline reads, NASDAQ composites wild swing precursor to bounce history shows. Trading data analyzed by Bloomberg shows that in the other five sessions since 2000 that saw the Nasdaq composite closing the green. After reversing a drop exceeding 4%, the decline came to a stall and a sharp rally ensued for a few days to a few weeks. The trading session in the US on Monday had a feeling of a short-term capitulation, quote-unquote, says Thomas Hayes, the chairman of Great Hill Capital in New York. The key signals for a tradable bottom to be confirmed will come from earnings of technology companies and some market-friendly Federal Reserve guidance on the balance sheet reduction, he said. The first two instances of same-session recovery of more than 4% came in the midst of the dot-com bubble from 2000 to 2002. The next pair appeared around the Great Recession in 2007 to 2009. And notice the trend here. Most of these reversals, these massive reversals of 4% or more, happen under bear markets. Pay attention now. And therefore, we call them bear market bounces. They produce massive gains for days, perhaps weeks, and then they fade again. The most recent before Monday's event occurred during the so-called correction from 2015 to 2016. The Bloomberg data show. And here is the other part. After the bounce happens, it's going to be faded again. The headline reads, strategists who predicted this market route also see more selling. There is probably more downside over the next few months as the market adjusts to the reality of the Fed removing accommodation, earnings, slowdowns, a much less federal stimulus, said Ed Klesold, the chief strategist at Ned Davis Research. And rumor has it, Mr. Klesold already sold his portfolio. But anyhow, he predicted a double-digit drop in stocks and today is warning of a correction on the order of 20% from the early January peak. The S&P 500 could slide another 12% as quote-unquote tightening tantrum gathers pace, according to Mizuhu, strategist who came into 2022 warning of a 10 to 15% plunge in the second quarter, if not sooner. And by the way, this bearish outlook will continue unless, here it is, we can see this downward pressure on the equity market being relatively sticky unless there is a catalyst for a much less hawkish Fed and general global central bank reaction, he said. So once again, bear market rallies are notorious, but they will be sold out again so long as the main headwind for the market, which is the hawkish stance by the Federal Reserve, is not removed. And look at this. So far, after the hit to the Nasdaq, the valuations are back to the same levels at May 2020. But the reversion to the mean 
means that we're going back to the yellow dotted line, the 10-year average, which by my calculus means another 20% drop in the NASDAQ 100. It's not going to happen all together in one shot. We're going to have stops. We're going to have rallies. We're going to have rebounds. But so long as the Fed remains hawkish, we're going down to the mean. And if the margin calls start to hit, we're going to pierce below the mean. And how could the Federal Reserve change their stance? They're already behind the curve when it comes to inflation. Inflation is soaring out of control. For example, today we got the Richmond Fed Manufacturing Index. And look at the expectations for January 22 when it comes to the price trends. Prices paid, prices received. The expectations were for about 6 points. What we got today, prices paid 14.3. Prices received 11.27. A massive shoot higher. The expectations of price gains and the most alarming fact here is look at the manufacturing activity a pulse for the pace of the economic recovery and the pace of economic growth and it's diving down so the pace of economic growth is dropping down on the other hand the trend for prices is moving higher be it prices paid or prices received when you have prices moving higher that's inflation. Now, inflation is good so long as growth remains intact. This is not what we're seeing here. We're seeing the pace of economic growth diving down. Meanwhile, prices are sticking higher. This is a classic definition of a stagflation. The worst and most destructive economic phenomenon. And the Fed will have no other choice but to channel its inner Volcker. Look at the Philly Manufacturing Index that we got last week. The expectations for prices paid moved higher again. And the expectations for wage inflation, according to the Philly Fed Manufacturing Index, the forecast is moving higher again, and it remains in 1970s territory. And the expectations for higher prices continue to move higher and higher and higher. According to the Fed Philly Manufacturing Survey from last year, the special question was, the firms were asked about their expectations for changes in various input and labor costs for the coming year, meaning this year. Responses indicate an expected average increase of 8.9% for raw materials, followed by energy, intermediate goods, health benefits, and total compensation, wages plus benefits, which are all expected to increase 6.4% on average. The firms also expect wages to rise an average of 4.9% in 2022. Once again, this is the worst case scenario. Prices moving higher, the pace of economic activity slowing down dramatically, pushing the Fed in a very unfortunate position. But again, the Fed has nobody else to blame but themselves. Jerome Powell orchestrated this disaster by his indecision, by his insistence that this inflation is transitory. And of course, He's been doing that to prop up the stock market higher to make the rich richer. And now there is a price to pay for all of that, and we're all going to pay the price in this stagflation economy while the rich already cashed out and they're licking their chops, waiting for the crash so they can scoop all of these assets once again at a much cheaper price, further concentrating the consolidation of wealth in this country. Today, the IMF downgraded the global outlook for the economy, indicating that inflation is surging higher and the thing disruptions in China. All of these factors will push the Fed and other central banks to become more hawkish to shift from easing to tightening the monetary policies across the globe. And therefore, the IMF is downgrading the outlook, the global economic growth. Once again, prices moving higher, the picture for growth moving down. Classic stagflationary crisis. And it's not just the IMF. The World Bank also downgraded the outlook for the economic growth in 2022 globally. Another alarming indicator, we're seeing junk bonds dropping like a rock. Junk bonds move higher under easing conditions. Junk bonds drop big under tightening conditions. You have to understand this. When we talk about junk bonds, these are garbage zombie companies with huge debt obligations. And they're now facing a tightening monetary policy and higher interest rates. It is a recipe for an upcoming epic disaster in these companies. And here it is. The Goldman Sachs U.S. Financial Conditions Index would have been enjoying the easiest financial conditions in history as the Fed printed money trillions of dollars out of thin air, showering the stock market, the real estate market, pushing these assets valuations to the stratosphere. And now everything has to come down to earth. 
crashing. On top of that, Credit Suisse indicates that perhaps the Fed will start unwinding their balance sheet immediately. And that could be a recipe for disaster because it means that the Fed will start dumping securities and assets. And here are the expectations from the CNBC Fed survey. Hawkish across the board. Take a listen. Steve Leisman joins us now, Steve, with the latest results from the Fed survey. Yeah, latest and most complicated ever, Joe. Market expectations have turned aggressive for the Fed compared to the last CNBC Fed survey with respondents looking this year and next for multiple rate hikes and significant balance sheet reduction. Here are the Fed's expectations. The Fed hike, first hike now firmly seen coming in in March. Three and a half hikes uh, are forecast this year. That shows that three are baked in and the debate now in the market is whether there's a fourth this year. An additional three hikes expected in 2023. And the balance sheet runoff seen beginning in July. That is much earlier than the prior survey. Now, we don't know much about how the Fed is going to run off the balance sheet. Here's the first look at how respondents think it could happen. They look for $380 billion to come off the $9 trillion balance sheet this year and $860 billion in 2023. While most think it's going to be phased in, that is, they'll increase the amount of the runoff as time goes by, the average respondent looks for a monthly runoff pace of $73 billion eventually. That is far faster than the last time the Fed did this in 2018. Over about three years, the average respondent looks for $2.8 trillion to be run off or about a third of the balance sheet over a three-year period. Now, of course, we'll listen to Fed Chair Powell's press conference on Wednesday for any guidance on both the pace the Fed is actually considering for balance sheet and rate hikes. Here's the long-run look at the Fed funds rate. Just over 1% this year, 1.8% next year, and the terminal rate now pegged in to be hit in March 2024 at 2.4%. So quarterly hikes are looked for at least for this year. Asked if the Fed is moving too fast or too slow, of our 36 respondents say the Fed is significantly or somewhat late in addressing inflation. One more point worth considering. While the outlook for Fed tightening has increased, as has inflation, the outlook for unemployment went down and the forecast for growth, Joe, went up. Now, I disagree with the survey about the outlook for growth, but needless to say, market expectations turned hawkish in a big way. So far, we talked about my expectations of this market and certain experts' expectations, that we are dipping into a bear market territory, and this is infused by the Fed's tightening, which is a result of inflation surging out of whack. In a bear market, be it in the transition stage or once we actually dip, into a bear market territory. We're going to see massive rebounds. We have to follow the indicators. Once we see oversold readings, extreme ones, extreme fee readings, we have to follow these indicators and play the rebounds from a trading perspective. Let's hear what the pumpers and the retail crowds thinking when we talk about the sentiment pulse in this market. We start with pumper Nancy Davis, who's a big shot at a big shot firm, who cares? But she says the Fed should take its time to evaluate the economy. Lady, the Fed is already behind the curve. The Fed took more than its time to evaluate the economy. They've been beating the drum that inflation is transitory, transitory, transitory. And we now know it's not transitory. They've been saying, oh, we're not going to taper, we're not going to tighten, we're not going to raise interest rates until we see full employment. And we have yet to see full employment because the Fed never defined that. So the Fed is already way behind. Yet Nancy Davis says the Fed should take its time. They should wait a little more, perhaps uh, magically. Inflation will turn out to be transitory. Just look at crude oil prices today and you'll have your answer. And listen to what she says, being skeptical about the Fed's tightening due to the upcoming elections. Take a listen. And so I also agree with Josh that I don't think there are going to be that many. uh, Right now, the market's priced in almost four rate hikes this year in 2022. And with midterms also this year, I think that's a little aggressive. And my counter to that is, are you insane? In every single poll that we got so far, voters are turning against the Biden administration. They're blaming them for inflation. Inflation is the number one issue. So if anything, if the elections are going to impact the monetary policy, it's going to impact it in a way to tame inflation. But these Wall Street morons... They live in a bubble, and this bubble is the stock market. They believe that if the Fed tightens, and in doing so, crashing the market, it's going to be bad for Biden and the Democrats heading into the 22 elections. And I say at least 45% of Americans have no attachment whatsoever to the stock market. They care about inflation, the poor, the middle class, average folks. 
outside of your bubble care about inflation inflation is destroying their wages eating away their purchasing power and reducing their standard of living dramatically tackling inflation is more important than the stock market when it comes to the elections just look at the consumer sentiment indicator that we got today consumer sentiment is diving down and the reason is inflation another famous pumper from jp morgan marco kolanovic what a stupid son of a bitch who's been saying buy the dip, buy the dip, buy the dip. The market doesn't care about higher interest rates. The stock market party is not over yet. If you listen to Marco, you're down big. You're catching a falling knife. But now he comes out and says the selling is overdone. Maybe. But you better change the endless pumping on steroids. Otherwise, your reputation is going to go to the dumps. Another one. Tom Lee, one of the biggest pumpers in history. What a stupid son of a bitch. Listen to what he said on CNBC today, and he got corrected right away by his own firm. Take a listen. Yeah, Scott, how are you? I'm good, thanks. So did we bottom yesterday? What are we supposed to do as investors now? Uh, well, as you know, when, when sell-offs start, you never know when they're going to finish. But we've already seen such a big reset that I, I, you know, I think unless someone thinks the economy's turned, and the bull market is peaking, and that's not our, our view, right? Uh, these these are great entry points for people because you've got so many stocks down, and, and yesterday had the feel of get me out of everything, which has been part of this buyer strike. So, yeah, so the bottom line, Scott, is you know, I think people have to look at this as a, as a really attractive opportunity in 2022. You know, uh, I am I'm pulling from a note that you guys had, and I think it was from your technical um, strategist, um, Newton, retests look likely. Yep, Mark, I mean, Newton. Mark Newton. So, I mean, you, you're saying it's a it's a buying opportunity, but your some of your people at least are are thinking that we're going to have retests, right? That this today is is likely not the only one. I want to be clear on exactly you know as as we're telling people now's a buying opportunity that it still could be turbulent moving forward. That's right, Scott. Um, Mark. For anyone who wants to use technical and buy entries, which is what Mark's trying to provide insights for, um, and someone who wants to find a tactical low, you know, uh, when when you hit the bottom and, and everything, from there, the selling is completed. According to Mark's work, we're not there yet. And just a reminder for younger viewers and market participants who are not familiar with Tom Lee. In 2008, he predicted that stocks will be, quote unquote, much higher by the end of the year. Matter of fact, Thomas Lee, back when he was working at JP Morgan, made the most disastrous call in stock market history. He predicted that the S&P 500 will end the year at around 1,590. In reality, the S&P 500 crashed and closed the year at around 903. And here it is, the most disastrous call in stock market history when Thomas Lee recommended to buy Citibank stock in 2008. Had you followed Thomas Lee, you went down by over 97%. Again, these are fake analysts, they're pumpers, and in a bubble, a mania market that continues to go higher. Irrationally, they look smart. They look like a bunch of geniuses. But guess what? Even my dog has been calling for the stock market to go higher in the past two years. Another one, Wells Fargo. They're not saying buy the dip like we're saying, buy the dip with the anticipation that it's going to be faded again. They're saying buy the dip for good. Matter of fact, they say it is time to put new money to work, quote unquote, because the market is bending, not breaking. When we talk about sentiment indicators, here's an important one retail investors when retail investors become irrational bidding the market higher and higher and higher with euphoria buying stocks with no profits with no revenues pushing multiples to insane levels like a bunch of zombies on meth it is perhaps a good call to fade the market to get out to bid against the market and when retail investors but too bearish they're pretty much waving the white flag it is perhaps a good call to buy the dip at least in the short term. In this case, retail investors are waving the white flag. Just the tiny little correction that we got since the start of the year is freaking out retail investors, specifically those who joined the stock market in the aftermath of the 2020 crash. They haven't seen a real crash yet. They haven't seen corrections yet. They're programmed on autopilot to buy, 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 regardless of the valuations. The worse the company's financials, the better. AMC, GameStop, Revion, ARK Invest, 
waste, garbage, dog shit, that's what works for them. But in this correction so far, they're extremely terrified. And I even tweeted this as a contrarian indicator. I said my teenage nephew has been holding a massive bag since he's been engaging in YOLO investing. He's been so proud, by the way, that he bought Snapchat. He's been bragging endlessly in 2020 and 2021. Not anymore. But anyways, he told me today, this is at the time when the tweet was released, that he wants to start buying puts because the market is going down. This is already after the market was down big. So I'm using him as a contrarian indicator. The moment he shorts, I'm buying the dip. And guess what? The retail crowd, on Monday, they bailed out just before the rebound. Just listen to the number one financial YouTuber, Meet Kevin. What a stupid son of a bitch. YouTube trader Meet Kevin says he dumped 20 million dollars of stocks and crypto as the market route shakes retail investors. Baffer Rabrath said that despite the major sell-off in stocks seen over the past two weeks, he thinks market have not yet hit quote-unquote peak fear and that declines have further to go. Baffarath says, I am worried that we are really just at the lifeboat stage of the Titanic, he told viewers. We are certainly not at the rescue phase yet. And I say, Mr. Paffarath, what are you smoking? What we've seen so far is the captain of the Titanic seeing the iceberg on the radar. That's all there is. We haven't actually seen the iceberg. We haven't hit the iceberg. The ship is not crashing yet. That comes later. Anyways, stocks have dropped sharply so far in 2022 as investors have braced for the Federal Reserve to raise interest rates over the coming year. Bond yields have risen sharply. This is exactly what we talked about in my video about the Buffett indicator. Paffer Rabrath have long been an advocate of dip buying. He told viewers that his opinion of health of the health, excuse me, of the market has changed. So Paffarath is becoming bearish now. He said that he saw similarities between today and the stock market crashes of 29 and 2000, with investors shunning fundamental analysis of companies in favor of momentum trades. Kevin, we've been saying this in this channel since the summer of 2020. I've already seen it. I've already called it. You can go back to my videos. I pointed out the similarities between the mania that we had in 2020 and 2021 back in the summer of 2020 with 1999 and 29. But you guys are just catching up to that. And who's been doing the pumping, by the way? Encouraging retail investors to be engaged in these mania nonsense assets like cryptos and garbage companies with no revenues, no profits. Here's another one for the AMC crowds, you know, the apes. God bless them. Take a listen. I got to ask you about AMC. And, and as you know, every trade has an exit strategy. What is the exit strategy now that the stock is 77 percent below its 52 week high? I mean, if you're hoping for the mother of all short squeezes, the opposite has happened. Yes. Yeah, so I think I would look at that a couple different ways and of course these are just my own opinions obviously i'm not a financial advisor but since the start of 2021 until now amc is actually up over 700 percent fortunately i actually got in at first around the eight dollar mark so i think it's good to kind of see where this entire saga has actually taken us um but for me my personal risk i put money on the table that i'm willing to let this go to zero because beyond just liking the company I really like what it stands for from a symbolic nature. Oh, so now it's not the mother of all squeezes. What happened to the shorties about to get squeezed, continue to buy AMC, Diamond Hands, Hoddle, Hoodle? What happened to all of that? Now you're saying it's symbolic? We went from the mother of all squeezes to, oh, it's just symbolic. People poured their life savings in this garbage, believing all of these pumpers, and they're now losing big. Who would have thought that investing in a bankrupt company is a great idea? What a bunch of geniuses. It's actually a disgrace to the retail crowd to represent these people as retail investors. We've been here all along, before the COVID crash. Retail investors been here, mom and pops, all along. We've been trading and investing in the stock market with discipline, following the fundamentals, following the momentum, following the charts, following the earnings. The retail crowd is much bigger are much smarter than these donkeys. And by the way, AMC is on the verge of bankruptcy now. After Adam Aaron, you know, the silverback, already dumped millions and millions of dollars. Now they're talking about refinancing their debt as a desperate attempt to keep this company on life support. They're going to borrow on higher interest rates and longer durations. This is a recipe for disaster for a company that's pretty much on the verge of collapse. You need a million Spider-Mans 
to save this company. The only reason that this company did not go bankrupt already, number one, the Fed pumping trillions and trillions of dollars, buying corporate assets and corporate debt, pretty much banning bankruptcy in the stock market. Well, that's going to change now. Number two, what kept this company afloat so far is the retail participation, pouring millions and millions, if not billions of dollars in the stock, waiting for the holy short squeeze. In the meantime, the company used that cash to reduce their debt, meaning kicking the can down the road, pushing the stock value higher so the executives and the insiders can walk away rich, leaving you holding the bag. It's the biggest scam in human history. It is certainly the crime of the century, what happened in the stock market between 2020 and 2022. The largest transfer of wealth in human history. And unfortunately, the retail crowd willingly participated in that transfer of wealth because the stock market ceased to be an investing opportunity for the public and became a dumping ground for the rich, the 1%, the insiders, to dump on the heads of the retail investors, the mom and pops who are looking for the lottery ticket. Look no further than the IPO market, for example. IPOs used to be an opportunity to engage the public in the prospect growth for certain company. Not anymore. IPOs these days are just an opportunity for insiders, executives, the rich to dump on the heads of the retail crowd who are buying the hype. They're buying the misinformation. The valuations don't matter. It is once again the same story of every single bubble. The rich ends up walking away richer. The poor walks away poorer. With that being said, we have to move on to cover the market information today, starting with the performance. And uh, here we go. The Dow Industrial Average down by 66.77 points or a decline of 0.19%. The Nasdaq down by 229.61 points or a decline of 1.67%. The S&P 500 down by 53.68 points or a decline of 1.22%. What about the sector's performance today? Leading the pack at number one, capturing the gold, the silver and the bronze. Energy outperforming the rest by far. On the other hand, the laggards of the day led by technology, communication services, and cyclicals. What about the advanced to decline ratios? NYSE, 37% advancing versus 59% declining. The NASDAQ, 38% advancing versus 58% declining. Again, when you see these exaggerated ratios to the downside, we usually see a pop, a rebound higher, at least in the pre-market session. Moving on to commodities, the futures. What's going on here? Massive upside day for energy futures. The WTI was up over 2%. Brent almost up by 2%. Once again, if you thought inflation was transitory or it's about to ease, think again. I am calling this right now. If the Fed doesn't tighten the monetary policy aggressively, we will see a hundred handle on crude oil Brent if not the WTI. Gasoline prices also moved higher along with heating oil prices. On the other hand, natural gas down by almost 3.5% today. We're going to talk about natural gas in a minute. Stick around. But here it is, softs, the decline in lumber continues, down big now, but still elevated at around 1,000. Lumber lost almost 4% today. We have muted activities for sugar, OJ, cotton, and cocoa. Meanwhile, coffee, riding high, by almost 2.5% gains today. Metals, stable gains across the board, modest gains for gold, silver, platinum, yet we have notable gains for copper over 1% today, and palladium continues to move higher, gaining 2.5% today. Meats, muted action for live and feeder cattle futures. On the other hand, here it is, the new big tech. Lean hogs, shooting higher by 2% today. Pretty soon, we're going to see lean hogs at 100 bucks. The futures for upcoming month on lean hogs indicate the prices will move higher. Forget about the Nasdaq. Forget about the big tech. Lean hogs is the real deal. Moving on to grains, we have massive gains led by oats, over 3% gains today for oats, followed by wheat, almost 2% gains for wheat, soybean oil also gaining almost 1%. Well, we have muted activities for the rest of them, soybeans, soybean meal, corn, rough rice, canola, pretty much on the flat line. Now, here are some commodities news for you. Today in the press conference by Propaganda Minister Saki, she was asked about the tensions between Russia and Ukraine and what happens if Russia invades Ukraine and cuts off the supply of natural gas to the European Union. What will happen to natural gas prices here in the United States? She did not even answer the question. Take a listen. Josh, why don't you kick us off? Thanks, Jed. Two subject areas. Yep. First, Ukraine and Russia. The mm -hmm. president is going to have his meeting with European counterparts. What does he plan to discuss with them, and how does he plan to address the issue of natural gas? 
given that 40% of EU's natural gas imports come from uh, Russia? Sure. Well, as we put out just a little bit earlier today in guidance, the President will hold a secure video call with European leaders as part of our close consultation and coordination with our transatlantic allies and partners in response to our shared concerns over Russia's military buildup on Ukraine's borders. Uh, during that conversation, uh, we expect they will discuss diplomacy, deterrence and defense efforts, and we'll have a readout for you all afterwards. And certainly, uh, the uh, a discussion about uh, pending uh, the pending sanctions or a discussion of that, uh, we, we would expect to be part of that as well. Uh, but in terms of the impact, uh, I don't have anything more to read out for you on that front. And then later on, she was pressured to answer the question. And she said, oh, the natural gas markets are all localized. So whatever happened in European natural gas prices, it's not going to impact the U.S. market. Somebody please send propaganda minister Saki back to school. Because if that is true, then why did the White House today beg Qatar to increase their natural gas production? Qatar happens to be one of the largest natural gas reserves in the world. Now, the folks in Qatar said, yes, we have a lot of natural gas but it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of investment to ramp up the production on a short notice. If the Russian supply is about to be cut off from the market, then European natural gas prices will move significantly higher. Now, the production from Qatar could take advantage of the arbitrage by moving some of the shipments from Asian destinations to Europe. The problem is, by doing so, we're going to have a shortage of supply in the Asian market. The bottom line is, if Russia cuts off the supply, we're going to have an imbalance between demand and supply, which will push prices higher across the board, be it in the US, in London, or in Asia. Natural gas prices will move higher because the demand is sky high. As a matter of fact, it's going to move higher on hoarding behavior. The psychology is important in warfare. Other European nations and consumers will hoard natural gas ahead of time. Another commodity that we continue to watch is lithium. Lithium prices are shooting out of whack and this will push the cost of production for EVs higher and higher and higher. This green energy policy is an absolute disaster. By the time these cars arrive to the market, the EVs, they're going to be priced so high it's going to be out of the reach for the majority of consumers. In the meantime, energy prices are being pushed higher due to the harsh aggressive policy against oil and gas producers. There is no incentive at all. Banks are not lending to small producers of shale oil or natural gas, which will mean energy prices, in this case fossil fuels, will continue to move higher. Look at coal, for example, the best performing commodity of last year. On top of that, even green energy, lithium, or solar costs are also moving higher. This is the disaster of the rapid shift from fossil fuels to green energy, the abrupt transition, which should have never happened. It should have been a gradual transition. Folks, if you think inflation is transitory or it's about to cool down, think again. Everything is moving higher. Moving on to the big casino, the options market, what's going on here? The volume remains down. The retail crowd remains shy. They're not participating here by buying calls. And this is keeping the upcoming rebound from happening. We need the retail crowd to start buying calls once again for the rebound to happen in this market. Anyhow, the hottest table by far is NVIDIA with almost 1 million contracts traded today. About 58.5% of those were calls. At number two, Apple. Look at the massive drop in volume for Apple. Only about half a million contracts traded for the name, about 57% of those were calls. Remember not so long ago, we used to see 1 million, 2 million, even 3 million in options volume traded for Apple alone. Not the case anymore. The mania is being washed out of the stock market. And here it is, number three, Microsoft. With a little over 400,000 contracts, about 56% of those were calls. And here are the unusual activities that took place in the options market today. Let's start with the ticker XLE for the energy ETF. They continue to make upside calls, and I bet we will see a 100 handle in crude oil prices. They're buying these 75 calls for the expiration date April 14th, with the expectations that the name will pop higher by more than 15% by then. They paid about one buck a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about six and a half million dollars. And what about the trade for the ticker HD Home Depot? They're betting the name higher by buying the 390 calls for the expiration date March 18th. With the expectations, the name could pop higher by more than 8.5% by then. They paid about 5 bucks a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $7 million. At the bottom of the table, what about the ticker NVDA NVIDIA? We have some news we'll cover in the 
heat map analysis in a second, but the buying calls here, the 235 calls, the expiration date February 18th, with the expectations that Nvidia will move higher by more than 5% by then, they paid about 11 bucks a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $10 million. Lastly, in unusual activities today, what about the ticker MSFT Microsoft? What a roller coaster ride for this trader here. He got it right initially. If you're watching the after hour action in Microsoft, it was down big over 5%. Now it's trading higher again. Somebody bet the right bet at least initially. They bought the 260 puts for the expiration date this upcoming Friday, January 28th, with the expectations that the Microsoft would drop down by more than 10% by then. They paid about three bucks a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about two million dollars. Moving on to the heat map analysis. What's going on here? On face value, when you see the bloodbath in technology, software, chips, the big caps, communication services, the mania names like Zoom, Roku, Twilio, etc. You might come under the impression that today was a value stocks kind of day. It wasn't really, even though we're seeing IBM moving higher, the classic big pharma names moving higher, oil and gas, etc, etc. What we saw today is a hybrid between value, but more specifically the inflationary theme, which is increasingly becoming more limited to oil and gas. Oil and gas up big, we're seeing the defense contractors Lockheed and Raytheon also moving higher. They reported earnings today. Banks are moving higher on the heels of the 10-year yield also rebounding slightly today. We also got earnings from American Express. Amex came out clean, showing that the higher end in the consumer is doing fine. The rich, the higher income, they're doing great, they're booking travel plans, they're using their cards, and therefore AXP blasted higher. Big Pharma also moving higher on the heels of J&J, &J, which reported earnings today in the morning, and that lifted Pfizer and the rest of them. IBM, similar story, reported earnings yesterday. They moved higher. It was a roller coaster ride up and down, up and down, but it decided to close in the green by almost 5.5%. Ericsson, the ticker ERIC, also reported earnings in the morning. It came out pristine, and the name moved higher. Other notable movers, Wynn Resorts, moved higher on the heels of this news that the Las Vegas-based hotel and casino is planning to open a resort in the UAE. And this piece of news moved casino stocks higher. Be careful though, because we have earnings Las Vegas Sands tomorrow. NVIDIA, we're talking about NVIDIA. Here's the news hinting that NVIDIA might abandon the $40 billion acquisition of ARM due to regulatory pressure. And I say this is good news from NVIDIA. You really don't want to spend a lot here. When economies are slowing down, and the Fed's policy is tightening. Look at what's going on with Microsoft. The acquisition of Activision is absolutely insane. $70 billion for a company that perhaps worth less than $30 billion. Anyhow, here's the heat map for the ETFs. Energy moving higher, but everything else is down. With exception of the financials, the XLF barely in the green. We're seeing gold also moving higher, but look at the contrast between growth and value. Both of them are down, but value still outperforming growth. When it comes to international markets, my pick, the EWZ, continues to outperform. This is the Brazilian stock market. It was the underdog last year. My prediction is it's going to be the outperformer this year. Moving on to the charts analysis, starting with the SPY, the S&P 500, 30 minutes chart. We opened down today. Everybody was panicking, but I was looking at 430 as support. It continued to hold over and over and over and over again. To me, this was an indicator that this BY is about to move higher. And indeed it did. It went all the way, almost to the high of the closing candle of yesterday. And then it pulled back. Is the action that we got today bullish or bearish? I would argue, despite what you think, that this is actually bullish. Going back to retest support, confirming the support, and then moving higher is actually bullish in nature. Are we now looking at 434 and a half as support? Are we looking at 438 as resistance? Here's the daily chart for the continuous contract for the S&P 500. Again, it looks scary right now. It looks as if the S&P 500 reversed a lot. And indeed it did. But this is a process of shaking out the weak hands, both the longs and the shorts. They're not going to make it easy for you here. You got to have conviction. You got to follow the indicators. The momentum indicators are way oversold. The risk versus reward says it's better to be long right now. It's better to buy the dip in anticipation of a rebound rally. The selling volume came at lower than the days before. This is yet another bullish sign 
with the S&P 500. We are still trading above 4,232. We have yet to breach that one. There are calls out there for a retest of the bottom again, and that indeed could happen. But in my opinion, if we go down to retest the bottom once again, it's not going to hold because erasing the entirety of this massive rebound is bearish in nature. What about the Qs? 30 minutes chart. Once again, it opened down, gapping down. Everybody's panicking. Yet the chart held onto the support of 343 over and over and over again. To me, this was bullish, not bearish. And it moved higher, facing the resistance at around 352, and then it pulled back again. I wouldn't call the action today bearish. I wouldn't call it super bullish either, but it is a process. Bottoming is a process. We're now looking at the support of 343 and the resistance once again at 352. What about the daily chart for the continuous contract in the Nasdaq? Again, scary. Closing below 14,000. Certainly, the Qs in the Nasdaq is a lot weaker than the SPY, the S&P 500, but the momentum indicators way oversold. We just need Jerome Powell to not surprise us by being too hawkish here. And the market is going to rebound and continue to rebound for perhaps a few days. If Powell comes out too hawkish, then all bets are off. But for now, we look at the volume. The selling happened at a lower volume than the previous two days. This is yet another good sign for the bulls. The majority of the selling is drying out here. And my line in the sand would be retesting the bottom once again. If we go down there, in all likelihood, it's going to fail. So the queues better move higher. With Microsoft, who knows how Microsoft is going to open in the morning. It was down big in the after hours. Now it rebounded higher. If it continues to hold in the gains, then the queues will open higher. But if Powell confirms, what's already priced in then the indices will rebound led by the queues here's a 30 minutes chart for the small caps the russell 2000 iwm it gapped down but yet again held into support of 196 and a half and then it moved higher all the way challenging the closing candle of yesterday and then pulling back slightly after a massive rebound is this bullish or bearish i'm not going to say it's bearish I'm not going to say it's super bullish either, but holding onto the support of 196.5 is indeed bullish. Dixie, the dollar index, what's going on here? The momentum indicators are moving higher. It appears that the Dixie is attempting to recapture 96 as support. But remember what I shared with you yesterday, that the speculators are abandoning the upside bets on the dollar. What does that mean? Perhaps they're anticipating that Powell will surprise us by being slightly dovish, and this will push the dollar index down. And by the way, look at this. Bloomberg says, it's the dollar, stupid. The dollar weakness has historically reversed the S&P 500 corrections. Every time the dollar weakens, it paves the way for a rebound rally in the S&P 500. And if the dollar goes down, it will indeed be good for gold. Gold has been holding steady. I've been listening to the news, by the way, CNBC and the likes. And they've been shitting on gold. Who the f*** is this? Anyhow, they've been shitting on gold. They've been saying, oh, with all of this volatility and uh, inflation and all of that, how come gold didn't move higher? You geniuses, gold has been holding steady and moving slightly higher, steady eddy. Regardless of what the dollar has been doing, regardless of what the 10-year yield has been doing, regardless of the sell-off in the market, gold has been holding. It is passing the test so far. And I believe if the dollar index goes down, gold will start to move higher and outperformed tremendously. Here is the chart for the 10-year yield. Let's brainstorm some scenarios here ahead of Jerome Powell's conference. For now, the 10-year yield is holding at around 1.77 as support. The bearish scenario says, what if this is a beginning of a bear flag formation? We switch to a line chart. What if this is the beginning of a construction of a left shoulder in a head and shoulder pattern, which will push the 10-year yield down. Now, the bullish outlook says, what if we were about to form a higher high once again, pushing us all the way to around 1.9% this time around? It will all depend on what's priced in and what Pal is about to say. So far, we've been pricing four interest rates hikes. In recent days, amidst the sell-off, those expectations went down to around three and a half, perhaps three. So if Powell confirms the outlook that it is three to four, maybe lower than that, maybe he's going to use the magic phrase data dependent, we might see a weird phenomenon in which the 10-year yield moves higher along with the indices, specifically the NASDAQ. And I know you might say, say what now? What's going on? The 10-year yield moves higher along with the NASDAQ? 
Yes. And here's why. If it happens, of course, we're not saying it's going to happen, but if it happens, the 10-year yield moves higher for two reasons. The good reason is moving higher in anticipation of higher growth in the economy. But the 10-year yield could also move higher for the bad reasons, among them inflation expectations moving higher. Let's say Powell comes out dovish and says we're going to be data dependent. Yes, we're going to normalize the monetary policy, we're going to tackle inflation, but we're going to be data dependent. And the market interprets that as dovish, even though he said it before repeatedly. And then we see the 10-year moving higher. What? What's going on? The 10-year moves higher because Powell is less hawkish, meaning he's going to allow inflation along with growth to move higher. And this is the only way we're going to see the 10-year and the NASDAQ moving higher together. Anyhow, moving to the TLT weekly chart for bond prices, what's going on here? It's a bad looking candle, but yet to reverse last week's candle. There is still hope for the TLT holders to move higher, but in all likelihood, in the long term, we're moving down to revisit 134 and a half. The outlook has not changed. What about the fixed four hours chart? Look at the MACD indicator from a four hours perspective. It has been a spot on indicator pointing out when the SPY is going to bottom and when it's going to top. What is the MACD indicator doing right now? It is topping. It is curling down. It's about to cross producing red impressions in the histogram. What does that mean? An upcoming bottom in the SPY. Because if the MACD is about to cross, creating red impressions in the histogram, and the VIX is about to top, you put two and two together, this is the risk versus reward. We cannot predict the future 100% accurately, but we can use these indicators to make educated bets. What about the VXN for our perspective? Look at the contrast between the VIX and the VXN. The VXN has yet to top. It is not curling down. It might do that tomorrow, but for now, it is not curling down. It is not close enough to produce red impressions on the histogram. And therefore, the outlook for the SPY looks a lot better than the Qs. Here it is, Apple, what's going on here? If Microsoft holds gains, Apple will move higher, perhaps retesting that resistance of the channel the upper band of the channel, I will take it from there. But if we see a flush down tomorrow, then Apple will go down to 150, the next support. And here is a one hour chart for Tesla, the souffle, what's going on here? It continues to rebound in the trend line. This is exactly what we've been looking for for a long time now. It closed the gap, the gap down that is. Yes, all in all, Tesla was down today, but it's not a bad tape at all. It moved higher, it closed the gap, it retreated for a little bit, but it could continue to move higher. We have earnings coming out tomorrow. It all all depends of what the atmosphere, the psychology is. If Jerome Powell comes out pleasing the market, it doesn't matter what Tesla is going to report. The stock will blast higher after hours. If, however, Jerome Powell turns the mood gloomy once again, then it doesn't matter what Tesla is going to produce after hours. When it comes to growth, top line, bottom line, the stock will go down either way, because we're trimming the high value, high multiple names in the market. And lastly, what about tulips? BTC, Bitcoin, still holding, asking any buyers, any buyers, any buyers, forming that bear flag pattern. If the buyers don't show up, it's going to flush down to 30,000. If the buyers do show up, it's going to move higher to recapture 42,000 as support. The buyers are waiting in the sidelines for what? They're waiting for Jerome Powell. And that leads us to the conclusion of this video. What do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? We have new home sales. Who cares? The most important event tomorrow is the FOMC statement and the big dog, the press conference by Jerome Powell. Jerome Powell has a tough job tomorrow because he has to balance the hawkish and the dovish side. He also has to surgically pick up his words. And if the staff is listening, and I know you are, he shouldn't use the word tightening. He should use the word normalizing. We're normalizing the monetary policy. We're normalizing the balance sheet. We're normalizing the interest rate policy. We're going to tackle inflation. We're not removing our commitment from reducing inflation, but we're going to be data dependent, meaning if the economy sours, we can add whatever accommodation once again back into the equation. If he does that, he will please the market and the market will move higher. If he screws up and concentrates on the latest behavior by the stock market, and he freaks out and starts walking back the commitment in tackling inflation, it's gonna fire back, Mr. Powell, if you're listening. You gotta double down on the commitment of tackling inflation, but you gotta be also delicate in doing so by keeping the door open for any adjustments. And lastly, what about the earnings calendar? What do we have tomorrow? 
Big day ahead because we have AT&T, Whirlpool, Abbott Laboratories, Freeport McMoran, Boeing, Edwards Laugh Sciences, LAM Research, Intel, Tesla, and Las Vegas Sands. A lot of action tomorrow. The most important day of the week, so buckle up here, folks. But this is all I got for you for now. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. I will talk to you again tomorrow.